All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Rachel Dunham, and I am the Community Engagement Coordinator with the Xerces Society. We are joined here today with two very special guests, Leslie Campbell, who is a Xerces Ambassador volunteer. She does education and outreach for us, extraordinaire. And Morgan McAllister, who is a new volunteer to us, who helped Leslie with this presentation. So before we get started here, I wanted to talk to you all a little bit about the Xerces Society. So Leslie, if you would go to the next slide for me. Sure. Thank you. So maybe you heard about the Xerces Society through a friend or you saw this webinar on social media. If you don't know who we are, we are a nonprofit organization that is worldwide, um, predominantly nationwide, that works on invertebrate species, their conservation, um, advocacy, research, and edu education. We have over 50 staff members. About half of those are in Portland, in the Portland area. The other half are spread throughout the United States. So we do work, um, you know, in many different areas with farmers, with corporations, with private landowners, and now with gardeners and with communities. And we're really excited today um, to talk more about that. And we work on species from um, bumblebees and fireflies all the way to freshwater mussels. Next slide. We just want to take a moment here to thank um, any of you who may be um, a donor or a member of the Xerces Society. It is truly because of your support that we are able to do these webinars and able to do the work that we do. Um, so thank you so much, especially during this time. I know it's very difficult. And if you're interested in becoming a member or a donor, just want to learn more about um, who the Xerces Society is, please check out our website at xerces.org. All right, if you wanna to go to the next slide. All right, so now I'm gonna pass it off to Leslie and Morgan who are gonna introduce themselves and get started. Thank you both so much for your time today and for all the work that you put into this webinar. I'm really excited. And so are we, <laughs> so thank you. Welcome everybody, it's so great to see the poll. We really didn't have a, a sense of who was going to be visiting today. Um, I am here as a nature lover a parent, all of, all of the different categories that showed up on the poll. And mostly I really love getting people out in nature and um, discovering things and having fun, just exploring and not necessarily needing all the answers, but just being in the moment with whatever shows up. So today we're going to uh, make some suggestions for you, maybe get you out and about with a different set of eyes on things, uh, get you maybe thinking a little bit differently in ways that might expand your thinking. A little of my background, I used to play with snails quite a bit on the side of my house. And uh, that was in Northern California. I lived in Oakland, California, which is very urban, but I seem to be able to find little spaces all around um, that provided me with endless amounts of fun. So uh, from there, I studied geology. I was a hydrogeologist for an environmental consulting firm for a while. And then I decided I needed to learn about plants. So I studied plants and got a degree in landscape design. And then I realized I really love teaching. Um, I work with the Columbia Land Trust and the Audubon Society here in Portland, Oregon, where I'm based. They have a backyard habitat certification program, which really helps people to discover what is happening right under your nose. And it was through that program that I began loving the ability to teach. I would visit gardens and talk about native plants and the forage that uh, it provides and the cover and shelter for other larger organisms. Um, and I work with the city of Wilsonville. There's a very special person, that, uh, Carrie Rappold, who is the head of natural resources there, who has integrated all of our partnerships um, really well and invited me in to teach teachers about what's happening just outside the classroom door. Um, so we are integrating all kinds of knowledge and um, I just hope you have fun today with me exploring. I'll be your guide at the side with Morgan and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, we'll love to answer the, them at the end. Hi. I'm Morgan McAllister. I'm here to assist Leslie in walking you through the activities we've created for you today. Um, I've also always loved the outdoors. Um, I've worked at the Multnomah Outdoor School, which is here in Oregon. Um, and I'm currently finishing up my bachelor's degree in biology and assisting in an invertebrate lab at Portland 
state, focusing on solitary wasps. Cool. So today we're going to be walking you through a field journal that we've created. It's a compilation of activities and prompts to aid your exploration. All of the activities are meant to be self or student led as well as place based to help you make connections to the ecosystems near you. Xerces has a link to the journal as well as education page full of additional resources and other activities. The activities we're going to be touching on today are cultivating curiosity, which will focus on how to explore and seek connections, form and function activity, which focuses on adaptations and their uses, the creative wondering and writing, which will help you interact with nature and explore in artistic ways, our DIY microscope, which is an easy tool to make and utilize, and our habitat activity, where we can think about how we and other organisms interact with their environment. So one of the prompts that we use all the time as um, outdoor leaders and um, just friends, people who uh, maybe we're with, we wanna kind of prompt the openness of just noticing and observing. And it's crazy how once you start saying this out loud, <laughs> <laughs> how much more you do notice or you observe and how much you might end up wondering. So stoking curiosity um, is something that we're born with, you know, it's natural. Um, but there's something about actually saying, I notice, whatever it is, I wonder, huh, out loud. Um, and then it reminds me of, so drawing from our past experiences and, and usually very positive associations out in nature we can really begin to understand our interdependence and, and notice really great interconnections. So um, you'll hear us, we're, we're gonna <clears throat> show you a few videos whereby we are demonstrating how we actually speak this out loud. And uh, what we know is those ideas that we have that fire together, wire together in neuroscience. So it, it will help you literally speaking out loud will help you inculcate and build uh, information. Here we have a couple of our scientists um, from Xerces out in the field. Something that is um, fascinating to me is when we have direct contact. So it's the direct experience that can really inform our own relationship to the earth. Here on the right is um, a study that Xerces is conducting on the Oahe River and other areas um, on freshwater mussels. I had no idea. It's fascinating. And then on the left, you can see that someone is probably trying to capture some insects. Um, it is this quiet, direct experience that can really enhance um, our moments out in nature. So I encourage you. Um, one of the techniques uh, that Pat on the left there is showing us is the zoom in technique of learning. Um, we might catch something fluttering around just on the outside of our peripheral vision and follow it to a plant. Um, in this case, he's looking at one of our na native asters. It's next to a huckleberry bush. Um, and one thing that I really love about Pat is he's super enthusiastic and excited about learning. So if you have a friend or a child or pretty much anybody, it can be a stranger on the street. When you're noticing something, I encourage you to just to speak up and say, wow, look at that. You know, whatever you're noticing, it can be super spontaneous and, and super fun. We'll cover these other techniques as we go through the slides. Um, so I won't speak about them right this second. Uh, Xerces is very um, focused on our understanding, our connection to food and water. And this is a really simple pictorial that uh, Morgan actually drew. I'm not very talented when it comes to drawing, so I asked if she would please do it. Um, but as you know, we're involved with a lot of pollinator work. We supply pollinator plans to farms. In my area in Portland, uh, I've been able to work with some of the farms and uh, bring students onto the farms to understand what's going on. I encourage you if there's a, a farm or even a community garden near you to go ahead and 
either just ask if you can observe for a while and enjoy and learn from the gardeners. It's very, very powerful. Um, also decomposition. If you happen to be walking around in a forest, you'll notice the forest litter and decomposers at work and have a, have a close up look, take your time and note that they are making soil for us that then make and maybe can grow huckleberries or some of the wild things that we love. So one of the things that we have and we come super well equipped with are our senses. And sometimes it's that sensing, if we just slow down and, and whether we're in our house or looking out our window or out in nature, we can really key into what's going on um, at a micro level and also kind of a macro level. Um, so we're gonna start with our senses. And obviously the one that we might use the very most is is what we see. So if we slow down and just open our, our lens, um, especially at different times of the day, it can be very illuminating. Another wonderful thing to do is sort of what I suggested with Pat um, in the earlier slide is when we share enthusiasm, it makes life more fun and enjoyable. If you have um, any type of farmer's market that you can go to, many of the farmers really know about earth cycles and insects and invertebrates. Um, it is through this pairing and sharing, which I call sharing is caring, actually, um, that we gain insights too and points of view from other people. There's multiple intelligence intelligences out there and we can really learn a lot when we just kind of slow down and listen, and it widens our lens of learning. Um, when we are out there as learners, um, if we can have a pal or take time to explore and communicate with someone in a very caring, connected way, it can really enhance the experience. So, encouraging you, this is a public event at a farm, and obviously um, a daughter and a father are here, but I had a lot of visitors come to my table who were just individuals that wanted to know more. Xerxes has these wonderful specimens. Many people don't know that we have native bees and we're relying more and more on them for pollination. Um, so this was an opportunity to, to look at our little native bees and know that a lot of them look like flies. They're teeny tiny. Some of them are iridescent. And then of course, there's the beautiful bumblebee that is big and furry. So please do come out and enjoy what we have to offer. So we're gonna start with being inside. I um, like the motto, work with what you have at hand. Keep it easy at first, take baby steps. And um, Start becoming comfortable and uh, stoking your curiosity with, with, with what you find. Here I have a game called Windowsill Science, and on a regular basis, I will find things hanging around in my house. And normally they're dead, sometimes not always, but um, it gives me a chance to feel really safe. So I'll come in and be able to touch something like the moth and feel its nice little powdery and delicate wings. Uh, I can look really close up. So on the spider, I found him in my sink and I took a toothpick and he was kind of cuddled up. So I, I opened up his legs and I put him on this paper towel and then I noticed he had actually changed positions <laughs> later on. So he survived, I was able to put him back outside. But it is these um, wonderful opportunities to compare and contrast and learn about these anatomical features and, and wonder, gee, how do they live and where do they live? And what are the strategies that they use to get their needs met? Kind of fun. So this here is a, a magnifying glass that you can create using simple and accessible household items. Um, it's a great tool that you can use during both your indoor and outdoor exploration to help you notice the minute details that you might otherwise miss. Um, we'll be showing this tool in action in just a few moments. It can also be really great to be inspired by the beauty and details of nature. 
Um, it may be a great idea for you to translate what you notice and wonder into written work or a drawing, accentuating the features that you find most interesting. Um, or you can use an activity such as this amazing butterfly mask, um, which is available on the Xerces website, along with an assortment of other fun and engaging activities. So I'm not very crafty, but we do have an activity um, entitled Make Your Own Insect and Habitat. And I have a problem with English ivy in our neighborhood. So I took it upon myself to eradicate some of the invasives. There's also um, in this composition, a dandelion leaf and then some leaves that just floated to the ground and then dried up. And I thought I would mash them into the paper bag that I used as a base. Um, but I, I had a problem diving into this activity because because I'm not very crafty and I felt oh, a little bit inadequate. But then I remembered one thing I've always wanted to be is invisible <laughs> and kind of a fly on the wall, not being heard or seen. So um, this is how I expressed it. And uh, it was actually really, really, really fun. And you can probably see my ivy butterfly there camouflaged within the matrix. One of the things that uh, we know about where we live is there are things happening right under our nose or outside of our, our door, our front door. One of the activities that we, we like to do um, is on a rainy day or maybe it's just super hot and humid and we don't feel like going out is to do um, an investigation through the window. And one way to do it is by journaling. So in the journal that we're supplying, you can use any piece of paper. We um, have an activity where you can you can draw or you can write or just ponder um, lots of free pages in it but what's cool is you can really notice different things when you're just focused on putting pencil onto paper um, it's kind of a I don't know a drawing meditation and I found it to be really useful because when I do that I see things that maybe normally I would have decided to just overlook and it also helps if you have a friend or a children and you just want to have fun is you can look outside and say well huh look there's a tree there where are things living is it huh there's water just start noticing what's going on outside that could actually be habitat and then maybe make a plan to go out and see for yourself so like Leslie mentioned, once you're comfortable exploring from the indoors, it might be a great idea to venture out. You can always start by taking small steps, perhaps just starting on a porch or a stoop, and then you might venture out onto your local surroundings or neighborhood, um, and then possibly expanding out into even larger natural areas. Um, insects and invertebrates are very adaptable and they can be found under many different places under logs or tiles or in little sidewalk cracks and we encourage you to walk through an area that you know well and try to think of where an invertebrate might be hiding and how they might utilize that environment like these awesome garden snails which are found in my neighbor's front yard sometimes we might not see the insects themselves but perhaps evidence of their past activity we can ask ourselves, how might we know that an insect has been there? Sometimes we see the evidence such as these beetle trails or evidence of herbivory, like seen on this leaf. Um, and it's always fun to see if you can notice patterns or designs in these clues. You can also consider what adaptations an organism might have used or needed to create such evidence. And we come to the spittle bug. What's in a name? So I didn't know anything about this insect. I knew that uh, it existed because I would see these little bits of spit in lots of different places. And when I was putting this together, um, I noticed quite a bit of this activity in my neighborhood. And I wondered what really is going on there. So we've actually created a link. I found this super cool um, science YouTube provided through the New York Times science specialist. Um, what I learned, I'm not gonna give it all away because I'd really like for you to discover for yourself um, what this scientist is telling us, but 
this is a protective mechanism. There is in fact an insect in there and the insect protects himself with this foam or these bubbles through a very odd um, process that he uses for his body. And uh, then there's a snorkel apparatus that's possible that he uses to get air. That's all I'm gonna tell you. This is something that um, I came across. Nature has spectacles that uh, are super intriguing and kind of creepy sometimes that really draw us in. This is kind of a safe zone for me. I felt, all right, they're inside this web. They're not gonna jump out. They seem kind of quiet and sleepy, but I ended up waiting here for about an hour to find out if they would move much and, and they didn't. They weren't quite ready to come out, but um, we call this kind of a soft fascination. And when we're out in nature and we notice and we wonder and we feel safe, um, it can be a really beautiful thing. So give it time, allow plans to change if you do end up coming across something really cool. And um, you know, at least of that, maybe that agenda or plan is for you. So just a quick note on leadership styles. I saw a lot of you are um, interested in nature. And it looks as though some of you are actually outdoor leaders. So. We um, love utilizing the beetles.org page. It's a UC, uh, University of California, Berkeley project that helps um, with curriculum building for outdoor science. And one of the um, things, I'll have the link at the end, but one of the things that we really try to do most is be a guide at your side. So whether you're with a friend who's snorkeling for the first time and just really kind of timid and a little bit scared, maybe even um, we want to encourage softly and gently. Occasionally there's sage on the stage, which is you have someone who just knows the answers and it's very powerful and it's super um, fabulous to have those opportunities where you just get to get some good, accurate information right away at hand. And then the entertainer, and that is if you're a leader, especially sometimes, um, or a parent or just maybe there's a lull, um, you can change it up with maybe a little kinesthetic activity. Maybe pretend you're a butterfly or um, do some kind of impromptu move. Like buzz pollination is really fun. So we're going to show you a few um, videos to demonstrate what these different techniques might look like. So during these activities, Stop investigating and looking for insects at the ground level, we thought we'd start next to this driveway in an urban setting and see what we can find. So we're just going to rummage in the leaf litter. Leaf litter is a great place to look for invertebrates because there's lots of nutrients. Lots of decomposers like to look around here. You might find some slugs or snails or centipedes. See, already I found a couple little snails. These guys are really great at eating leaf litter. Look, they've even got some variety in here. Two different colored snails and slugs here. So we've got this kind of medium-sized darker brown and this other tanner one. And he's nice and small. But these guys would be great to note take about the differences and the similarities. And always remember to note where you found all of your cool insects and invertebrates that you can go back and find more later. So today we're looking around uh, the edge of this house to see what we can find. And I found a couple of really interesting spider webs. And I noticed that there are a lot of different kinds. So this one is kind of wide at the bottom and almost looks like a sheet to me. 
hands, or I guess it kind of reminds me of a hammock. And this one is really stringy. It kind of, all of the webs are spread out. And I wonder if maybe they were made by the same spider, or if there are two different spiders that choose two different types of webs. But it appears that they clearly like this area, and I wonder what is so appealing about this little, little tiny roofed area that makes the spiders want to live here. So we're going to have a, a poll open up. Rachel, if you wouldn't mind popping that up for us. Um, and go ahead and choose um, one of the three leadership styles that we've mentioned, uh, any of the ones that you picked up on in those last two videos. We'll give you just a few moments to fill in your answers. All right, so most of you picked up on the fact that we were primarily using guide at your side, which is absolutely true, although there were some moments of sage on the stage as well as the entertainer. Um, but we primarily use guide at your side to encourage wonderment and um, the creation of questions to be posed to either yourself or your companion while exploring. And we'll move on to our next three videos keep those le leadership styles in mind because we'll be polling again afterwards. Well, look here. We're noticing that there's a fly in very close proximity to a spider web. There's a little tension in the air. We're wondering what could happen next. So here we have our make it home microscope or magnifying lens. We found a little critter. Let's take a closer look. Wow, look at all of that detail. This is a segmented arthropod, also known as an isopod. These ones are pretty common. A lot of people call them pill bugs or potato bugs. They're one of my favorites. You can look at all the great detail and his little antenna and legs and body segments. I wonder where he likes to live in the garden. So we're in the backyard of my good friend, Susan Masta's garden. She studies invertebrates and she just suggested that maybe there'd be something under this pot. Shall we have a look? Oh well, my goodness sake, Susan. What might you um, say these are? Earwigs, little immature earwigs in the earwig family and millipedes. Wow. That is so cool. And why would they add saw bugs? Can you tell us a little bit about why they might choose to live under this pot? Well, the, the earwigs, those are all immature, so they probably likely hatch nearby and they're staying together as a family group until they mature. And the other, and all of these uh, insects under here are and crustaceans and millipedes are uh, need damp conditions which is perfect under a pot that gets watered. And there's even a slug. This is super cool. Thank you so much. So we're gonna go ahead and open up that poll for you. Go ahead and select which of the leadership styles you noticed in those last few videos.
Fantastic. So technically you are all correct as there was Guide at Your Side as well as Sage on the Stage and the Entertainer with a much higher proportion of Sage on the Stage as sharing knowledge and creating excitement through entertainment can be a great way to stay engaged throughout your exploration. So feel free to use a mixture of all of the styles when you are out discovering invertebrates. So we have a really, um, well, all of us have kind of different ways of interacting with nature. Some of us are more active and just want to be running around all the time or being in it in a super kinesthetic way. Others, maybe we're, we're more passive and we want to just take our favorite blanket out and lay out on a, on a piece of lawn or get by a river and enjoy nature that way and observe what's going on um, in a really quiet way. So we're going to demonstrate two different approaches, an active approach and a passive approach um, as it pertains to um, some stream and pond exploration that we've done. So we flipped it over this leaf that was in the water. You can see here, it's a couple little invertebrates hanging out underneath. To me, they remind me of shrimp, but I don't think they are shrimp. But I wonder if they will turn into something else, or if this is their adult form. They almost move like lobsters. But this is an insect that I would love to spend time writing about, and even drawing. So these images are taken from, there's a, the first one was an urban intermittent stream in Portland, Oregon. Um, a person doesn't have to go real far to find nature if we are looking for it, if our intention is to place attention on nature. Um, it can be the corners of your, your home. It can be outside your front door or it can be even maybe an intermittent stream in your urban area. So I encourage you to keep your science eyes open and alert. This particular pond is in a wetland area at 5,000 feet elevation next to the Payette River in Idaho. And uh, so I just want to point out it can, your observations, your noticing, your enjoyment can really happen anywhere. So the brain is set up for really loving novelty and uh, neurologically we know this and it's often the case where I might be walking along and something might catch my attention maybe out of the corner of my eye a movement or just something that seems a little bit different an anomaly in the landscape. Um, I encourage you and I think naturally you might be curious if you're a nature lover to to want to gravitate towards these things and say to yourself, what is going on here? And think about who lives there, maybe who used to live there, maybe who might like to live there in the future. And in this case, you know, you can see there's a lot of decomposition going on. There are a lot of organisms that have worked this stump. Uh, again, this is in an urban area um, in Portland and uh, you can find these things in the forest too. Just keep your eyes open. Um, sometimes we can see contrasting things, morphology in this case, in the, the wider landscape, the wider ecosystem that catches our attention and causes us to wonder what's going on. I was hiking up in McCall, Idaho, next to the same wetland, and I saw these um, strange mounds and well, let's just see what happens. Hmm. 
shapes are really similar, the morphology is similar. Um, but this one doesn't seem to have soil or grass growing on it like the others. Someone stuck a stick in it. Let's take a closer look and see what's going on. Can you see what I see? All right, I think I'm close enough. I think I'll back off, but this is fascinating. Wow, really gets my mind churning and wondering. Ooh. Seething is the word I might use to describe this activity. Fascinating. Uh, this is a really kind of a fun puzzle that I put together when I was walking along um, one day again up in McCall, Idaho, where the snow is just melting. Actually, there's still patches. This was just last week and I was cold. I wanted to get warm. So I chose a southern exposed road cut gravel road area. And when I was standing there, I noticed uh, a buzzing. And then I noticed that this buzzing was circling me. <laughs> Something was investigating me and I thought, my goodness, what is it? And I couldn't quite see it, um, but I could hear it. And so I followed it through my hearing to this, what is a talus slope? This is a uh, lateral moraine on a glaciated lake. So this is very loose soil. And I could see that some of the native phacelia, which is full of pollen and nectar right now, had just come into bloom and this southern exposed heated up um, slope was full of it. So I'm thinking to myself, well, 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 we've got some food going on here. And then I looked closer and I noticed some little holes in the soil, it's nice loose soil. And I was so intrigued and curious, I kept looking and lo and behold, there was this beautiful uh, mining bee sitting on, a, it's called an Erythronian grandiflorum. It's a, to some of us, called a glacier lily, which is quite magnificent in its, its own right. And uh, what, was, what was sort of fun is we, I looked at this and I thought, well, is that a bee? Is it a wasp? What is it? And, and we sent it across to, to everybody we know at Xerxes. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel, and found out that in fact it is a mining bee. So it's, and, and if you could look closer at this picture, you would see some pollen on its um, hind quarters on the back side. You would see lots and lots of hairs um, for gathering that pollen, some distinguishing features. So that was a lot of fun. It was kind of a mystery that got solved. It might be uh, another great idea to notice phenological changes, which are the changes over seasons and time. As we move away from winter and into spring and summer, opportunities are going to arise to see the changes in our environment and in the organisms around us. So here is a beautiful photo of spring uh, on the east side of the Sierra Nevada near the Truckee tributary. And now can also be a great time to notice how the resources in the ecosystem change, such as these willow blooms. Um, and it may bring opportunities to see pollinators and those ecological interactions in person. Forms of invertebrates often change throughout the seasons. Uh, you may be lucky enough to view them emerging or metamorphosing into their future life stages. So this is a really cool clip. Um, I have children down in Los Angeles County and I was able to visit there um, when this was happening.
So if you didn't guess, um, or maybe you did guess, these were monarchs in flight, and this was completely unplanned. Uh, we had a day at the beach, we noticed this green dot on the map, went up, found out there was this really cool nature um, preserve, and lo and behold, it was one of the best days of my life. Here in Portland, we do have some native plantings within our Portland parks. And this is a, an example of an alder and a dogwood next to an intermittent stream. And it was also adjacent to a, the main road that goes into the park. And so I just happened to be walking along the road, getting some fresh air one day, glanced over, and I noticed some activity that indicated that there was a special little organism at work here. So I looked a little closer and I could see some evidence. And then I got really curious and noticed that the leaf had been folded over and it looked like a little pillow. And I thought, huh, I wonder what's inside that pillow. <laughs> and so you can see what I found. Positive associations with our invertebrates and our, our insects, in this case, the bumblebee um, and the lavender that is actually getting some nectar from is, is really powerful. And over time and space, we can start making these phenological connections to the seasons, but also the, the beloved things that we also enjoy in life. Um, bumblebees are beautiful. There are approximately 50 different species in Northern America. They're easy to spot. They're very delightful. And they are the main pollinators for huckleberries and blueberries. So can you see them? Say thank you. <laughs> so art and literature, whether the consuming of such media or creating it yourself, can be a great way to connect to the environment around. Um, it's often engaging and engaging and can bring a, a creative side to your exploration. Yeah, so I didn't grow up in a family that was very academic or involved with um, literature or poetry at all. And I was really grateful to have an opportunity to be exposed to the beauty of being read to um, for the first time, actually, in graduate school. So this is my cohort and my professor, Mark, who has a very deep and abiding love for nature. He would bring his favorite readings out to us in the field after long days of hiking. This is a beautiful place. If you can ever get to it, I encourage you. It's the largest wilderness in the lower 48 states in America. It is called the Frank Church Wilderness of No Return. Absolutely stunning, riddled with incredible topography and streams and rivers. And we have bighorn sheep there. Um, lots of really beautiful wildlife. And here it was where, where Mark, after a long day of research and hiking, decided to, to give us a little break and read out loud. Um, is a beautiful voice. So um, when you're not uh, maybe knowing of these things, introduce other people to the things you know and, and that you love and um, invite them into the ways that you interact with nature. It's a beautiful gift. I wanted to say thank you so much for attending today. This is a little bit of art. Um, I am not art artsy either very much, but my friend Erin made it for us when we were developing the Willamette Wildlife Garden Guide. Um, she's very talented. And I have some resources that I'd love to share with you that uh, you can utilize pretty much anywhere. It's a short list of reading and then a link to the website um, or at least the website address for the Beatles Project. Really fun, amazing um, website for, for outdoor interactions. Thank you. We'll actually skip over this and come back to it later so that you can do a screenshot or write those down. But some other great resources that we have here at Xerces are community science. It's a great way to get, you know, kids or adults, really anybody out to nature. And I know quite a few of you are probably already involved in some of these projects. But Bumblebee Watch is a great one because it's an app that you download on your phone. 
you just go out and take pictures of bumblebees. Um, take a few pictures at different angles, you upload the photo, and then we have experts that um, let you know if you identified it correctly or not. And don't feel bad, I have yet to identify one um, correctly, <laughs> and I work for Xerces, not an entomologist, but um, sometimes it's a bit difficult, but it's just a really engaging way to get people out and curious and not to be afraid of bumblebees either, which I think is important. Um, the Pacific North Bus Bumblebee Atlas Project and the newly formed Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas Project are um, specific to um, specific states, but you can Google them. They both have their own website. It's a little bit more involved, but you survey for bumblebees twice a year during the season in the summer that they're out and you get to adopt a grid and it helps us really gain a lot of knowledge of both the populations, but also the range of where these bumblebees live. And it also impacts whether they are listed or not. So we use this data. It's really important and we appreciate everyone. Um, I know there's some trainings actually coming up for the Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas you can find on our website and we just had one for the Pacific Northwest. So thank you to all of you um, who may be volunteering for those and the work you're doing. And then the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper, you can um, look that up as well. It's a great um, map or app that you can mark if you've seen monarchs or milkweed. And of course, that's for the West, Western monarch population. So it's um, community science is a great way to get out. We also have quite a few resources um, on our website. Also that you can get these at Powell's or Amazon, or you can do it through a donation on our website. Um, but these books are very helpful. They're very colorful. Whether you're, I know we have quite a few master gardeners on this call and master naturalists. I apologize for not putting that in as an option earlier. Um, and you guys really are educators. I've never met a master gardener or a master naturalist that did not teach me um, something. And a lot of enthusiasm there, so thank you for that. But these are great books, check them out. The Attracting Native Pollinators is one of my favorites. Um, I do, I am a wildlife biologist, but I came from a background mostly working with birds and mammals. I was not, um, I didn't know a lot about invertebrates and I actually read this book and it, it gave me um, so much knowledge coming into this position and it was really helpful um, yeah, it's a great book. We also have a lot of just free um, publications on our website. We have a publications library, lots of different resources, including plant lists. We have more information about the community science programs, the Bring Back the Pollinator program, um, and you can also look by region. So we probably, I'm assuming, have people from all over the U.S. on this webinar. There is really something for everybody. Um, Xerces works very hard. If we come up with a publication, we wanna make sure that you know we have a plant list for every region around the United States. We almost do, um, but check by your region and you can find some great resources there. We also would love for um, you to connect with us on social media. All right, so now we're gonna dive into questions. We have a couple that are coming up. And um, as we're doing this, I'm actually gonna have you go to the next slide so that we can see those resources that Leslie has. You can feel free to jot these down. One of the main questions we got was about the journal. There are blank pages in the journal and that's purposeful. Um, that's so that you have space to draw and um, journal and that's why it's a journal. So there's blank pages. Those are not missing um, pages in there. We also had a lot of questions about the magnifier. The instructions for that are also in the journal. And I have a specific question. So Morgan, this is probably for you since you created mm -hmm. this, but um, does the drop of water provi provide the magnification in the magnifier? Uh, yes, it does. It uses the surface tension um, as well as the dip created by your plastic film um, to create a water lens. Awesome. Thank you. We also have a question about New England activities or citizen science that relate to the flora fauna here. I know that um, Bumblebee Watch is nationwide. So um, the Atlas is not, but Bumblebee Watch definitely is. And there's also a Firefly, I will have to double check on that, uh, but I can send you an email after this presentation and send you a few recommendations unless Leslie or Morgan, you know of any, um, or if anybody in the audience knows of any um, citizen science or citizen community science programs in New England, feel free to put it in the chat and your other um, attendees will be able to see that. All right, I actually think um, that's it for questions. The one last one we have is, did you record, what did you record your videos with? Somebody's wondering. 
Just a classic iPhone 6, I'm pretty sure. Pretty outdated, but still works. <laughs> All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much. Um, lots of great um, resources and um, comments coming back to you guys. So thank you so much, both of you, for um, your time. Oh, we do have one more question. Talking to people about bee boxes made with wood tubes and the op opinion that honeybees don't use them. What would bees, what bees do? Those are leaf cutter bees and mason bees. Predominantly mason bees use those. They're tunnel nesters and um, they're called mason bee houses, but other bees will also use um, tunnels like leaf cutter bees. There's also some um, grass carrying wasps, grass hopper carrying wasps that are pretty cool. Um, they use them, so you'll get lots of different um, insects using those. But I can send you resources if you're if you're interested. Solitary wasps will actually also utilize those, um, and they're uh, great for the environment as well. Um, so you'll get quite a, a large amount of diversity, especially if we use uh, variation in the diameter sizes of your nest box. Perfect. Thank you so much, Morgan. All right, well, thank you all so much for your time and thank you, Leslie and Morgan, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thanks.